Good morning, Prince George Wenyaw Church, and welcome to our second week of Sunday School. I really hope you enjoyed uh, the worship service today. We were uh, all uh, thrilled to bring it to you. We went to two locations. If you haven't seen it, I want to encourage you to go watch it. Uh, we were at the Old Gun Church Ruins, and we were also at the beautiful uh, old historic chapel of Prince Frederick's, uh, the wooden one. It was just a fun afternoon for everybody. The music, the liturgy, uh, the acolytes, the weather was uh, marvelous. So if you have a minute and haven't seen it, go back and watch it. I also want to remind everybody that we are sending a communion home for people that want it. Um, it doesn't make you any holier if you want communion or if you, it doesn't make you less holy if you don't want it. Uh, Bishop Mark has made it available. He's not making it mandatory. So if you'd like to receive communion at home, you simply need to email Hosanna at our church office or call the church office and ask for Hosanna and she'll put your name on a list. Uh, we've taken every precaution to make sure that the host has kept as clean and as sterile as possible. Uh, it's only been touched by my hands, which have been disinfected right before I place the wafers in a sealed vacuum bag uh, or, or a sealed bag that someone with gloves and mask, we both had masks on. Uh, so we've taken every precaution and they're gonna be brought to your home and handed to you at the door from one vestry member to you. So once you take them out of the, out of the small package and place them on an elegant plate somewhere in your home, maybe with some candles, uh, having the children, if you have children, help you. Uh, then when we do the Eucharist on the video, you can join us uh, and take the host along with us. Remember, as Anglicans, we believe that if you receive uh, communion in one kind, so if you receive the wine or if you receive the bread, you've received it in both. Uh, and that's been a tradition for a long, long time. Many people um, who are struggling with addictions uh, don't want to receive wine, which is fine. So receiving the host is the same as receiving both. Uh, this week, chapter 2, is all about the Bible. But before I begin, I'd like to open us with prayer. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, um, as we tiptoe into this vast uh, subject, this grand subject of your word, uh, the Bible, Holy Scripture, um, we beg you uh, to send your Spirit, because without your Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, like we have heard just in the gospel this week, uh, we need your spirit to open our minds to understand what it is you'd like to say to us. And we believe that you do speak through the Bible today, that you are alive and that you are present and that we can hear you and hear your voice and know your will for us and know your way for us uh, as we read your word. So we need you now, Lord, more than ever to come and to uh, inhabit our hearts and to inhabit our minds help to make the next 30 to 35 minutes uh, fruitful so that we can learn more about you so that it stirs an interest to want to know more about you. Uh, always remembering, Lord, that we're not studying the Bible so that we can stand on Scripture, but rather that so we can get underneath it. Uh, scripture always uh, is above us, and we're always seeking to learn more and more about you that we will never be able to fully exhaust. So thank you for this church. We pray against this virus. Lord, we pray that You'll keep the medical professionals, the first responders, the everyone who's out there, people working in stores to bring food and necessities to us, that you'll keep them all safe and out of harm's way. We pray, pray that the pestilence uh, of this virus will be driven away soon and that uh, modern medicine will come up with a way to provide a vaccine for it. Pray for all those who are suffering. We pray for all those who've died, that you'd comfort uh, the families of each person that's been lost to this. And Lord, we give you this time now, and we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So one of the things um, I want to encourage us to do is to have our Bibles and maybe bring them to our virtual Sunday schools uh, so that we could, if there was a Bible verse that was referenced, we could go and look it up. Actually, I'm starting today uh, with a Bible verse to open chapter two of Archbishop Williams' book, Being Christian. I, I know a few of you have stopped by the office and picked up a copy. And so I've actually got more page numbers in here that I referenced than I did last week. And if you haven't picked up a copy from church, I think we have about four left. You can also order them from Amazon. It's a, it's a small book. It's uh, easy to access. Uh, four chapters on baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. And so this week we're on Bible. And what I want to do is encourage us to bring our Bibles to these virtual Sunday schools. Uh, the one I brought today, I'm going to actually reference in just a minute. I have many, as you can imagine, uh, like a lot of us do. Uh, the one I brought today is an archaeological study Bible. Uh, it wouldn't be the only Bible I'd like to have on my shelf, 
but it is certainly helpful as we talk about the historicity of the Bible. Um, the Bible is a historical document. There are many things in the Bible um, that history uh, will demonstrate are true or, or that that place existed or whatever whatever the scene is in the Bible oftentimes um, we've either uncovered it in uh, archaeological digs or it still exists today so this this is a Bible that from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament has uh, wonderful maps it has wonderful cross references um, some of the more challenging Hebrew words uh, about towns and cities and things uh, it helps you understand just where those places were when they existed what they looked like so if you're a history buff um, I highly recommend this Bible. It's a fun one to keep, especially if you're in a Bible study with people. Uh, you bring this one to the Bible study and you'll be the, probably the only one there with it. So I'll get back to this in just a second. But I do want to open with a scripture verse, and so I'm going to pick the Bible back up. And we're going to turn to 2 Timothy, uh, way in the back of your Bible. It's one of the last books of the Bible. It was written uh, from Paul, we believe, to Timothy, and we know that because it opens that way. But we want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 14 through 17. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. I have um, an ESV uh, version. I think this is an NIV Bible, a New International. Yeah, it is. So let me read from my notes. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. And listen to what it says about God's holy word and God's scripture. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So that... Um, that those verses uh, actually uh, have two main points. The first is that God inspired the writings in the Bible. As evangelical Orthodox Christians, we believe that all 66 books in this Bible are uh, the inspiration and the words of God. They are given to men who wrote them down, but that we believe that every word in there is inspired, it is true, and it is timeless. Um, the second piece of this uh, instruction from Paul to Timothy that we need to keep in our minds is that the Bible has a purpose. Um, the, the Bible was written um, not just for our enjoyment, although it is remarkably enjoyable. Uh, if you read lots of the Old Testament, you'd never want to see reality television again. You'd get all the reality you want in the Old Testament. Um, it's written so that we can be led, we can be guided, we can be shaped, we can be molded, um, and equipped is that last word of the last sentence equipped for every good work complete it says so that the man or woman of God may be complete so there's something Paul's trying to say to Timothy about um, our lives and what what he's saying rather clearly is our lives are incomplete unless we are people or students of the Bible unless we are reading our word reading the word daily unless we are in Bible study with others which is one of the point uh, Williams makes at the end of his book I'll bring that up in just a second um, we're, we're daily, if we've got, if we're in computers or we on our computer a lot, daily we're, we're, first thing we do when we get to work is we open up our computer and look, there's a, there's a thought for the day or a word from the day. And it's usually a Christian author who's taken a piece of scripture and they meditate and give it to us. That's the kind of people we are because we believe that this word is profitable. That's one of the words, uh, that Paul uses, meaning it has value in our lives. Um, it guides us, it corrects us, um, it trains us. Um, it is active and living uh, like a two-edged sword uh, we can read in other places in scripture so the bible is just not a dusty old book that sits on the on the shelf or on the coffee table that's that old funny joke we tell in alpha sometimes where the preacher came over to the house now this is an old joke so some of you young people might not get it but the preacher came over to the house for lunch and they were all sitting in the living room mother father and three children and the father in order to impress the preacher looked at his son and said son Run over there and grab the good book so the preacher can read us something out of it. And the little boy ran across the room and came back with a Sears catalog. Um, the funny there is that uh, they were more, they often in their family read the catalog more than they read the Bible. And it was, of course, the good book. So um, that's not the point of the Bible. The Bible is not a showpiece. It doesn't just sit on your coffee table or on the front seat of your car 
so that your friends see it. No, it's actually something that's at times dog-eared. I would recommend that you have one Bible that you write in all the time. Um, it took me a while to get there, but I, I do love a particular Bible that I have that I've taken lots of notes in, and here's why. If I'm going to hear someone teach, I almost always take that Bible with me. It's a study Bible. I can look at the notes from the past teachings on that particular topic. If someone's teaching, for instance, out of 2 Tim Second Timothy, uh, I've got notes in the margins and notes on the bottom of the pages of that Bible. Um, and then thirdly, um, I'm a person who learns better when I'm writing. Everybody's not like that, but so writing helps me learn and remember better. Anyway, I'd recommend having a Bible that you can write in. So there's Timothy's uh, Paul's encouragement to Timothy about reading our Bible. And then let me let me read you from our 2019 Book of Common Prayer, uh, page 598. This is the collect for the second Sunday in Advent. This was written back in the 1500s. Um, listen to these words that we still pray today. Blessed Lord, who caused all the Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. So as Anglicans, we believe God has not only inspired it, but he's caused it to be written. Grant us so to hear your word, read your word, mark your word, there's the writing, learn and inwardly digest your word, and that by patience and comfort of your holy word, capital W, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you've given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thomas Cramner, who wrote this prayer, is praying three things. There's three points. First is, Lord, we need your help to read, understand, mark, digest, and incorporate your word into our life. Lord, we need you, which is why we prayed for the Holy Spirit. Um, the second is that this word is our blessed hope for everlasting life. That contained in the word, like the scriptures told us from 2 Timothy, is everything we need to be complete and equipped uh, for salvation. And that um, finally, the word's been given to us in living color through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, that's one of the points also that Rowan Williams makes at the end of this chapter, is that we're, as Anglicans and as Christians and as evangelicals, reminded to keep Christ at the center of all of our Bible reading and Bible study. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So chapter 2 uh, is essentially broken down into four different pieces. Uh, the first piece is hearing God's voice. Uh, the second piece is hearing the whole story. The third piece is Christ at the center, which is what I was just speaking to. And the fourth piece is reading the Bible together, which is what I talked about earlier in terms of being in a Bible study. So I'm going to go through these uh, four sections, pull out a couple highlights, and maybe uh, tell a story or two. So to the first piece of the book, hearing God's word. Um, Williams, I've got to find my book. Williams says this, in the very beginning, Christians are people who expect to be spoken to by God. That's from page 21, the beginning of the chapter. Uh, in the Alpha course that's been taught at other Anglican churches in our diocese and may someday, maybe even this fall or next spring be taught here, um, the course is broken into 13 sessions. Session six is called, How Does God Guide Us? What are the ways that God guides us? Uh, the first way, the top of the list for this particular section in the Alpha Course is through his commanding scripture. Um, there are five other ways Alpha says God guides us. The second is compelling spirit by his Holy Spirit. Um, but the first way the Alpha Course offers is commanding scripture. Uh, the expectation is that uh, the Bible will speak to us. Back to William's quote. We are people who expect to be spoken to by God. And the primary way we all can hear God is through his word that we can read, through his word that we can read. Um, I believe everybody uh, hears God's voice. Um, a lot of people don't know it or recognize it. And I believe that God is trying to speak to every person on the planet and that God will use any means possible. Uh, for instance, how many times have you been um, thinking uh, about a particular person in your life and then suddenly your phone rings and that person is calling you and you're thinking oh my gosh I was just thinking about you I was just praying for you I was just talking to a friend about you um, I believe wholly that there's no such thing as coincidence that we have a sovereign God who is in charge of and orchestrating everything and that uh, those kinds of moments are moments when God is actually 
nudging you by the power of his spirit to recognize that he's in charge. So, oh gee, uh, so and so, I was just thinking of you, I'm so glad you called. Maybe a nudge by the Holy Spirit. Um, God is speaking to each and every one of us. Williams, again, on page 24, says this, though, and I, and I like this, too. Um, but as we begin to read the Bible, as we begin to read it in groups and read it by ourselves, um, we'll begin to discover, or we should begin to discover, if we're in good Bible studies and we're using good study Bibles, that the Bible is not just or a single set of instructions. Um, it, the Bible is not a rule book. It doesn't begin with, uh, God says this and God says that. Um, the law that was handed to Moses, that God asked Moses to write down the Ten Commandments, um, there was an instance when God said, write this down um, and, and tell my people who want to keep covenant with me that these are the commandments that I'm giving them. There's an instance of that. But the rest of the Bible is not, especially when we think about Jesus, uh, he never speaks to people with those kinds of words. He speaks in parable or a lot of the Bible is written in poetry, or a lot of the Bible is um, written in a narrative or a biography. There are stories about particular people. Um, the Bible is not just one single set of over and over and over again rules. Um, it's a book about lots of things. Like I said, it's a book about God's law. It's a book about the history of the Jewish people, the, um, the, the Israelites. Um, it's a book that's full of poetry. Um, it's a book that's full of wisdom. There, there's a section of the Bible that's called the wisdom uh, literature. It's a prophetic book. It's a book where people who have been called by God to be prophets have spoken to a generation of people about either another generation of people or a time to come. Um, and it's a book of revelation. It's a book of God revealing himself to us. I tend to say it's a love story uh, and not a rule book. Uh, so the, I guess you could say, it, is it one or the other? You could say, well, yes and no. It's, it's both. Um, one of my professors at Trinity, a, a woman named Erica Moore, who taught Old Testament, one of my favorite professors, used to say this. And at first it put me off because it seemed sort of simple-minded. She'd say, the Bible we have is the Bible God wants us to have. And it reminded me of people in my past who'd say, well, the Bible said it. God said it, someone wrote it, the Bible's got it, so I believe it. It was kind of this simple little uh, bumper sticker theology that kind of made me think, well, it's a little more complicated than that, isn't it? Um, in this case, I've come to actually love Erica's simplicity because I do believe if God wanted us to have a different Bible, and we have plenty of translations, um, that he would have provided that. But the 66 books that we have, the books of the Old and New Testament, um, I believe are exactly what God wants us to have. And so I don't spend a lot of time wondering about the things that were not put in the Bible or the things that were put in the Bible because this book is so active and um, so inspiring and so helpful. Uh, I do believe that this is exactly what God wanted. So there's my take on the Bible and I agree with Erica Moore. On to the second section, hearing the whole story. I think this is very, very important as we read our Bibles. So the first point is um, we're, we're going to hear God's voice when we read his Bible. Um, we're going to hear God's voice when we're studying the Bible with other people. And what we're going to begin to understand is the Bible is not exclusively a rule book, like Gary says, or like Gary would posit. The Bible is, in fact, a conglomeration of many styles of writing. And I would say, overall, it's a love story. And it's a story about God's uh, redemptive mission for his creation uh, here on earth. The second section that Williams talks about is titled Hearing the Whole Story. And what Williams is trying, the point he's trying to make is that when we read a section of the Bible, we need to always have the entirety of the Bible in mind as we're reading that one section. What we don't want to become are people who pull a scripture verse or a sentence of a scripture verse out and then beat people over the head with the absolute truth of this one scripture standing all by itself. Um, we need to look at the entirety of scripture when we're looking at anything in scripture and ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about, I'll use the topic, war? Um, what does the Bible say about war? Overall, from the beginning to end, what does God say about war? What does God say about poverty? What does God say about money? What does God say about sex? Oh, let's look at the entire book and, and begin to have conversations about what God says about it. Um, one of the ways that you could, in the beginning, uh, do this, I'll give you two ways. One of the ways is to look at the Bible um, as this book uh, describes it, the drama of scripture, 
the subtitle is Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story. This was a book that was given to me in seminary, um, written by Craig Bartholomew and Michael Goheen. And their um, take on the Bible is that it's um, essentially a, a story that repeats itself over and over again that has four parts. And here's the parts. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. That the Bible over and over and over again tells stories about the creation, the fall, the redemption, and the new creation. Let me give you the meta narrative, the big meta narrative. Creation, Genesis, uh, Garden of Eden, everything's perfect, no sin. Adam and Eve having a blast, uh, naked and unashamed, uh, have full run of the garden except one tree. Uh, no war, no famine, no poverty, everything is perfect. And by perfect, I mean they are in perfect uh, relationship with their creator, God. Fall. Satan comes onto the scene, sows seeds of doubt. Uh, they sin and are cast out of the garden, but not before God covers them. That's fall. So we have creation and fall. Um, the rest of the Bible until we get to Jesus dying and rising again on the cross is the story of the fall. It's the over and over again narrative of the Israelites. It's the prophets begging people to come back to God who've forgotten to care for widows and orphans, who've forgotten and created idols in their life or taken idols from other cultures. The rest of the Bible would be the story of the fall in its entirety. Jesus comes back, uh, has three years of ministry, is crucified, it rises from the dead. There's our redemption. In Christ, we have our redemption. And then new creation is everything after Jesus up to Revelation when he shall come again. So there's the overall picture of the Bible, creation, fall, and there's a long period of the fall, redemption, long period there, and then new creation. So we're living in the in-between times between redemption and new creation. Um, so the unique thing is, uh, for instance, we did a tattoo art exhibit. That's a whole nother subject. I don't want to get into the ethics or the morality of tattoos right now, but uh, we had done it at a church in Pittsburgh. It was called Hear Me. Uh, we were more interested in the stories that went along with the tattoos on people's bodies than we were with the tattoos at first. But as we spent more time with folks who had gotten these tattoos and we learned more about uh, the stories, we fell in love with them and they fell in love with people from the church. It was an amazing uh, turnabout. Uh, two sets of prejudices were torn down. Um, as we went out into the community at night to restaurants and bars and places, and we would sit at tables and invite folks that we noticed who had art with the permission of the manager to take a picture of their tattoo and to get the story we had a little sheet that we filled out um, what the folks from church who at first were a little reluctant to want to talk to people in bars with tattoos discovered was that these stories and remember the name of the exhibit was hear me these stories contain beautiful beautiful um, pieces of love of commitment of honor of duty of all the words that you read in the new testament um, and that's the reason the person had chosen to put that art on their body. They wanted a lasting reminder. Um, the, the reversal of prejudice on the other side was that people who have tattoos, or at least some of the people we encountered, um, felt like that people from church were narrow-minded, mouth-breathing, knuckle-dragging bigots. And um, what they discovered was that they were actually really nice, fun people who were interested in their lives. And so uh, we spent, gosh, almost half a year uh, going out on Week, weekday trips, uh, filming and taking pictures. We collected about 600 of them and we narrowed it down to 100 and then we did the exhibit. It was really a fantastic thing to do in the community. Uh, the second exhibit was called Hear Me Too. Anyway, um, but what we discovered in those tattoos was that as we spoke to them, we tried to explain to them the narrative of the Bible. That lots of times what they were talking about, especially as their art depicted it, was a time in their life when they had either fallen or when they had been given an opportunity uh, to be made new again, new creation. And so we tried to show them that their stories uh, mirrored the biblical story. So that's one way to hear the whole story of the Bible. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So as you're reading God's word, ask yourself, where, where does this fit in in that four-part meta-narrative? Uh, the other way, it's a little simpler that I've heard, and I've, I've used it at times, is to look at the Bible in, ter in two terms. Is what I'm reading talking about the kingdom of God? Or is what I'm reading talking about God's covenantal promises or our promises to him? Uh, kingdom and covenant are two ways as you read scripture. Uh, I had a teacher explain that 
uh, you could you could understand it in a broader way, a broader context. So if you knew you were reading something about the kingdom, then what you'd want to do is you'd spend more time in the Bible looking for other places where God talks about his kingdom. And then you could create a narrative of what does God mean when he talks about kingdom, and what does God mean when he talks about covenant. Um, one of William's points in this particular section is that God, or Jesus, doesn't just pronounce laws. He doesn't walk around going from town to town just reading the law. He actually spends most of his time telling stories. And this is a quote from Williams on page 27. That means that the whole of the story of the Bible is intended to have an effect on us. In other words, the Bible is supposed to influence us. It's intended to draw us in. It's intended to, to pique our curiosity, to make us interested. And it's intended to make us think about ourselves in relationship to God. And I love that. What is the Bible, what is what I'm reading, tell me about who I am, who humanity is, in relationship to God? Does it tell me that he loves me? Oftentimes it does. Does it tell me that I have been sinful and followed my own devices and desires? Oftentimes it does. Does it tell me that there's forgiveness? Many times it does. Does it tell me that I'm responsible at times for brokenness in this world? Yes, I've hurt people. Uh, and I probably need. So when we're reading the Bible, we need to ask that question or think of that Williams quote about how does this make us think about ourselves in relation to our perfect, loving creator God. Uh, this is the follow-up to that quote. William says on page 29, we need, in other words, to guard against the temptation to take just a bit of the whole story and treat it as somehow a model for our own behavior. In other words, we need to guard against what I like to call bumper sticker theology. Don't pull one sentence out and say, this sums up the entire truth of the Bible. It, there is no way that one verse could do that, or even one section. The Bible is too large. It's, it's too deep. It's a well that we can't plumb. It's an ocean that we can't find the bottom. Um, the Bible is an amazing book, and so to take one sentence, one verse, one half verse, and to point to it and say, this is it, everything else stands, is, is no way to read the Bible. It's actually naive and narrow-minded. Um, in this particular section, uh, Williams talks about the historicity of the Bible, and I, and I like what he says. Um, it, and, and it's um, historicity works two ways for him, and I, this is the point that I like the best. Um, what he says is the Bible just doesn't come at us as a story that we stand outside of. Because it's historic, um, it's our story too. If we are Christians, and this Bible tells the story about Jesus, our Savior, and Christianity, then we are, if we're grafted into Christ, part of this story. Williams goes further with that. He says, um, your life began, our life began with Adam and Eve. I mean, I don't think I think about that too often. I think I'm the son of Gary and Mary. I'm the grandson of uh, Newell and Mildred. Uh, but I don't often think much further than that and realize that, no, I actually believe, when I get right down to it, that I'm a son and daughter of Abraham or that um, I'm a relative of Noah or Moses. Uh, but the historical facts of the Bible and the people historically who are in the Bible, I am, we are, tied to them. And that's one of the ways we can treat it historically. Um, the other thing Williams does, and I won't spend a lot of time here, is he says there are places, and everyone knows it, where the actual history that we've been able to uncover doesn't match up exactly with the history the way the Bible tells it. In other words, chronology can get out of order sometimes. Here's what William says about that. History matters, he says, but that doesn't mean that you should lose your faith because the chronology of King Belshazzar's reign in the book of Daniel does not square with what people dig up in the Middle East on archaeological expeditions. Um, rather than get up hung up on all the details, he says, we should remind ourselves often, like we just mentioned a minute ago, what is God trying to tell me in these details? He later says this, to tie it all together, he says history matters, and we need to remember that there was a real historical time when there were real people in Babylon who were really thinking about lions, they were really thinking about the threat of death, and really thinking about the challenge of resistance. Um, so he's referencing two people there, Daniel, who was thrown in the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who uh, stand up against King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and what Williams is saying is, yes, those four men existed. Yes, they existed in a country called Babylon. But if the Bible has the dates wrong as it relates to other cultures and other things that we've dug up, don't let that, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, in other words. What's most important is, what is God trying to tell us 
when we hear a story about a person who's threatened because of their faith. But what is God trying to tell us uh, when we think about kingdoms on earth? Um, and that's where I'll kind of leave the history piece. The third section is keeping Christ at the center. Um, and this is what William says on page 35. Here is the story in which the speaking of God and the responding of human beings are bound together inseparably. In other words, when we get to Jesus, we get to a place where we can finally understand in perfect terms what it means for God to speak and for human for human beings to hear and respond because that is how Jesus moves through life. He is the only one who moved through this world that way. He's the only one capable of moving through the world that way. Um, he says almost every time he speaks when questioned that he only does the will of the Father. We are given many references in Scripture where Jesus is praying. He goes off to pray. He was, meanwhile, he was praying. He took a few disciples with him to pray. Jesus was in constant communion, unbroken communion and communication with his Father. And that's one of the points that the Bible brings out, is that God's desire is that every last man, woman, and child would be in constant communion and constant contact with the Father. And that, of course, is why Jesus came. Jesus came to tear down the penalty of sin, to, to pull apart the curtain, as one of the inklings said, to tear it in two, and to remove the barrier between us and our Creator God. And he was the only one who's capable of doing that. But what Williams, the point he's trying to make in this section is that as we read any place in the Bible, we should be questioning or asking ourselves, um, do we see Christ in this? Um, do we hear an echo of his voice in this, if we're in the New Te Old Testament? Um, is this a glimpse or a shadow or a premonition of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that every reference in the Old Testament to wood is pointing to the cross. Um, there are some references to wood in the Old Testament that do point to the cross, especially when Moses talks about his staff being raised, or when God tells Moses to raise his staff. Um, when um, God tells Moses that there's a curse on any human who's been hanged on a tree, Jesus is our curse. He goes and does what we deserve. He hangs on a tree. So there are many places where you could concretely see it, but Every place that a tree or a branch or a limb is mentioned in the Old Testament isn't necessarily a mention or, or a nod to the cross. But I will um, go as far as to say, if we spend some time and we do some investigation and we dig into our study Bibles, we will almost, we always will make a connection with whatever we're reading in the Old Testament to something that Jesus is doing, being, or living in the New Testament. Always, I just I know that's true, and Williams does too. He agrees with me that we should always keep Christ and and His life and work at the center of any place we're reading in the Bible. So, if we're reading the Psalms and we're hearing the words of David, and he's talking about being king, how do we relate that to our real king, the faultless king, um, the 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 king who judges with equity? How, you know, so there's always a place in our thinking that we want to take what we're reading and compare it to Jesus. And say, okay, Lord, what do you want to tell me about myself in relation to you? And what does this tell me um, about Jesus Christ, my Savior? So he ends the chapter, uh, page 36, by saying, reading the Bible is all about listening to God in Jesus. And I love that. I, one of my favorite parts of this whole book, uh, the idea that we listen to God in Jesus. That God so loved the world that he sent his son. That God wanted us to know who he was, what he was like, and what he would do for us by sending his only son into the world to save us. So I've, I've shown you two of the books. Let me just show you two of the others, and then I'll, um, I'll leave you with this last question. Uh, next week, uh, we move to, I believe, Eucharist, and then uh, the fourth week will be on prayer, and then, like I said, the fifth week, my wife will be here to hopefully tie all this together. Um, lots of, I mean, the, the, the things that are available to study the Bible, that I couldn't begin, I could fill the room up with all the commentaries. A couple of my favorite um, are hearing the Old Testament. In other words, this is exactly what William says as we read the Old Testament. What do we hear God saying? Um, and that's the subtitle, Listening for God's Address, written by Craig Bartholomew and David Beldman. Uh, it's, a, it's a slightly dense book. But it's a, a nice one as a companion. There, it's uh, beautifully referenced in the back. So if you were studying a particular book in the Old Testament um, and you wanted some more information about that, it's got a beautiful index in the back where, for instance, in Deuteronomy, there must be 50 references here. So if you were studying Deuteronomy, this would be a nice book to keep. And you could go and read what these authors said as it related to hearing God's word in the Old Testament. So something like that. 
And then um, this is a, one from the New Testament called Reading the Gospels Wisely, written by Jonathan uh, Pennington, uh, forward by Richard Baucom. It's a narrative and a theological introduction. Uh, the most helpful thing this book did for me was it showed me how the Synoptic Gospels tied together so beautifully. And one of the exercises we did, which is a really fun thing to do, maybe we'll do that for a Sunday school, is we'll get a book that puts all four Gospels side by side, and you can begin to understand just how accurate they are when you compare one Gospel to another. And remember, these were written uh, by mostly eyewitnesses. And so that's the best testimony you can get, you lawyers, you know that, is you want to call an eyewitness to the stand, somebody that was actually there and saw it. Well, our Gospels were written by uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, they have firsthand knowledge. So um, this is a great book about reading and understanding the Gospels. Here's the story or the question that I'll leave us with this week. Uh, why would you say, um, if you're sitting there with your family or if you're sitting there uh, alone, maybe write this down and, and ponder it, but why would you say it's important for all Christians to read the Bible in light of the teaching and life of Jesus Christ? I've given some hints. Um, if you have William's book at home, he's got several reasons why. But um, if you've got the book, maybe spend some time looking for those answers. But if not, maybe um, write them down and email them to me. I'd love to see what some of you think about why it's important for us to read the Bible in light of the life and teaching of Jesus. And if you could go a little further, why is that such a gift? Um, how are we... Um, so blessed is uh, the right word to be able to read our Bibles today in 2020 in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us uh, in, in terms of our salvation. So thank you, Prince George Winyaw. Thank you for uh, watching uh, our Sunday School. I look forward to being with you again uh, next week and talking to you, many of you on the phone this week. Feel free to email me any questions or comments that you have. God bless you.